Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for tuning in and for following and supporting the work of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development, uh, Balkans' leading foreign affairs think tank. Since our inception in 2013, uh, we've worked very hard to try and uh, help public in Serbia and in the rest of Southeast Europe make uh, a little bit more sense on uh, what is going on in this crazy world. But what we are seeing today is surely unprecedented. The world is in shambles, and this is no exaggeration. The world borders are closed. There are no flights connecting countries. Uh, there are about uh, close to a million people infected by this novel coronavirus. There are more than 30,000 people dead at this moment. The world markets, stock markets are in free fall, but also commodity markets. And uh, about a one third of the population of the planet is in some sort of a lockdown or quarantine. And it seems like the rest of the planet is going to continue in this direction too. Tonight, we are opening a series of dialogues, obviously virtual dialogues, uh, computer conversations with experts around the world. We are calling them Corona Dialogues. We are reaching out throughout the world to people with knowledge and wisdom and different points of view, trying to make more sense, trying to understand what is going on. Tonight, in the first, in the inaugural Corona Dialogue, our guest is a very dear and special friend of mine, my graduate school mentor and advisor at Harvard, my advisor at the UN when I had the privilege of presiding over the General Assembly, one of the most renowned living economists and public intellectuals, uh, the leader of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and professor at Columbia University, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Professor Sachs, thank you very much for joining us tonight from New York. I understand you are in a place from which some of the most dramatic reporting has been coming to the world over the past few days. First of all, how are you, Jeff, and how does it feel like to be in New York these days? Well, uh, New York, Boop, first of all, thank you for uh, having uh, this discussion and thank you for taking the initiative in the middle of a crisis period because we need information and we need to think about what to do. As you say, it's completely unprecedented uh, what's happening right now and it's very frightening uh, and there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty and a tremendous uh, need for clarity of uh, thinking and understanding of what's happening. Uh, New York, uh, as you know, became the epicenter of the epidemic in the last uh, week or so. Uh, that will move over time as the virus sweeps through different parts of the world. But New York is, of course, a hub of the world. Uh, tremendous uh, movement of people, a lot of people coming in from China, a lot of people coming in from Europe and a lot of people that brought the virus with them. Uh, the United States and uh, the state and city were not prepared for this at all. And uh, by the time I think people realized the scale of this disaster, uh, the virus was in uh, huge circulation. Uh, and uh, now the city is being uh, hit by a uh, I don't know what to say, an earthquake, a tsunami, a complete uh, uh, wave of uh, this epidemic. The hospitals are packed. Uh, people are dying in the hospitals. There's shortages of equipment. The city itself is in lockdown. But this is experience uh, that is uh, happening all over the world, as you uh, say, in some places are a week or two or three ahead and other places uh, are uh, finding uh, this curve rising right now. So it's dramatic everywhere. So Jeff, but can you explain to me, 
what is it so dramatic about this particular virus? I mean, we've seen in the last years and decades some very, you know, nasty things in the world. We saw Ebola, we saw uh, HIV, we saw earthquakes, tsunamis, you know, uh, but never so far, at least this is my, you know, uh, feeling, never until now the world has stopped, has come to an like almost standstill. So what is it so bad about this virus that is so much worse about anything else that we've seen in our lifetime so far? Well, the, uh, the, the point is that this virus has a, a number of characteristics that make it especially dangerous. First, it is easily transmitted between people uh, in uh, breathing the air, somebody sneezing and so forth. So it's a, uh, a virus that is uh, easily transmitted. Second, uh, it is a virus, and this is probably the basic point, uh, to which uh, none of humanity has uh, experience and therefore any kind of uh, immunity or acquired immunity. We have flu, we have other viruses that come uh, seasonally and the population as a whole goes through uh, uh, episodes of the disease and builds up immunity. But this virus, of course, is a new one for humanity. Uh, and uh, therefore, the entire world population, as far as we know, is vulnerable to uh, infection from this virus. Third, it is not only easily spread, but it is spread by people who don't have symptoms. Uh, it's now uh, with a lot of uh, evidence that uh, people who are so-called asymptomatic, they have the virus, they're shedding the virus and they're coughing and sneezing or even just in their breathing, but they don't even know that they're infected uh, or they're so-called pre-symptomatic, meaning that they'll develop symptoms, but they don't have them yet and they are probably infecting others as well. So that makes this especially nasty to try to contain. And then, Vuk, the fourth point, which is uh, clear, is that this is a killer. Uh, this is a virus that has a high uh, mortality rate. We don't know what it is because we don't measure all the cases. And usually you want to understand how many severe illnesses per infection, how many deaths per infection. Since we don't know the total number of infections, we can't calculate those numbers adequately, but it seems from a lot of evidence that this is not only spreading widely, but is creating uh, per case or per thousand cases, a lot of serious illness, more than a serious flu. And while flu affects a part of the population, this could affect everybody. So. The bottom line is a fast spreading virus, a virus not easy to control and spread because of its asymptomatic transmission, a virus that is going to create a lot of loss of life and a lot of serious illness. And uh, all of this adds up to uh, something different. If you take the other cases you mentioned, they are all uh, either much slower to spread and therefore more containable, or in the case of SARS, which broke out in 2003 and is also a coronavirus like COVID, is also probably from the bat population like COVID. People became sick with SARS before they became infectious to others. So it was possible to identify the case, isolate the person, stop the spread of the virus. Even that uh, disease took a lot of uh, toll, but this one is a lot nastier in the speed and secrecy of its spread. And that is really yeah. the difference with COVID. Yeah, but like Jeff, uh, now the, the world is slowly getting into like a total lockdown. Uh, we're saying that maybe even New York is going to be put in quarantine here in Serbia. We have an almost total lockdown for much of the day and 24 seven for elderly population. Uh, 
what are i mean is is this the way forward like what are the economic costs of total lockdown do you really think that uh like a full lockdown and uh, uh strong and agile social distancing is the only way forward because you know there are some countries uh for example in europe say like sweden that is uh that is not applying such drastic measures in sweden you have bars and restaurants that are open for instance and they're not having uh more dramatic numbers than a than a place that uh totally shut down things like germany and france uh what is it going to be the cost of this long term and uh is the uh, economic loss going to re resulting from lockdown going to cause uh perhaps even more harm perhaps even more deaths long term surely more misery uh if you if we continue applying these measures and if we do continue applying these measures like full lockdowns for how long how long is it going to take the idea of a, a total lockdown would have been unthinkable three months ago it, it wasn't even in the textbook uh, in the textbook you quarantined people that were sick uh, maybe if there was a massive outbreak in one community one neighborhood you would uh, quarantine the whole neighborhood and uh, try to stop the spread but the idea of a shutdown or a lockdown of a whole society much less of the world was not in the playbook three months ago so what has happened uh, what has happened is first the realization of the drama of the rapid spread of the virus. That's the first point. Second is some basic calculations that have been made repeatedly now by the uh, people who study uh, epidemics, the epidemiologists around the world and what they show in guessing, uh, but what the guesses are, the edu very educated guesses, is that if the epidemic is just uh, allowed to uh, go its so-called natural course, perhaps more than half of the world population uh, would be infected. Uh, and uh, in any country, uh, half or 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the population would eventually be infected and not just eventually by that i mean in a few weeks or months uh, because it sweeps so fast then if you say well suppose that 50 or 60 or 70 percent of the population is infected and 10 percent of those become complicated cases uh, you realize immediately the hospitals are totally unable to cope. And then if you uh, note that maybe 10% of those hospitalized would prove to be fatal, so maybe 1% or so overall of infections would prove to be fatal. We're talking about uh, numbers of illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths that are unimaginable. Uh, in the United States, to put some numbers, uh, our population is 327 million people. We could, in an uncontrolled epidemic, be facing, therefore, 250 million cases, 25 million hospitalizations, 2 to 3 million deaths. It's beyond imagining. Uh, and so this has led to the search for solutions. Now, the solutions, to the extent that we're finding them right now, are coming from East Asia. And that is where the lockdown idea really originated. Uh, it started in China. And I think China did something that uh, was shocking to the world and probably to the Chinese people. Um, but we're now all watching that experience. The epidemic broke out in Wuhan city in China. It quickly built to thousands, then tens of thousands of cases. Then uh, in uh, mid-January, uh, 
China put a quarantine around this city of 10 million people. And that was shocking. Uh, and then uh, after a few days, it expanded the lockdown to Hubei province and then to all of China. Suddenly more than a billion people effectively were shut down. What we say in the US lingo is sheltered in place, uh, but it means don't move except for absolutely essential purposes. Since then, it looks from the data that China has stopped the transmission of the epidemic after around 40 to 50 days. And so the reported number of new cases and the reported number of deaths stopped rising. And it looks like China is containing the virus. But there are lots of questions. Are the data accurate? Are the cases being measured? Uh, are we really hearing what's happening? So there is both the uh, scrutiny and some doubts. If you look around the rest of East Asia, there is to a greater or lesser extent also control, but in somewhat different ways. Some countries got on top of the infection early because they had the SARS experience. So they were on alert as soon as China announced a new virus on uh, January 11. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore went into alert. And they've kept the cases uh, quite low as a proportion of the population through not a lockdown, but intensive uh, testing and tracing of potentially infected people and then isolating them or quarantining them. And so they did it not with the full lockdown, but they did it early. Uh, Japan is another case that has kept the numbers low, kept open, but now it's experiencing cases and the mayor of Tokyo just yesterday didn't announce a full lockdown, but a much tighter set of policies. Korea is an intermediate situation uh, because it also did not lock down. And then some uh, churches in particular had a rapid spread of the virus, thousands of cases developed. It looked like it could be a complete explosion. And then Korea has dramatically tightened up as well. But the experience, Vuk, is that the US and Europe have not controlled the epidemic till now. The countries of East Asia in general are much farther along in controlling the epidemic. And the one that claims to have gone furthest is China. And if the data are right, and let us hope the data are true and right, they have shown that you can actually break the epidemic. Now, what yeah, are the let costs? Me, let me, yeah, the cost, the cost, and for how long is it going to last? Because right. let's say that after some months, you come to these uh, positive dynamics with, with numbers going down and all that. But then what do you do with your borders? Do you keep your borders shut? For how long do you keep the borders shut? And secondly, what is this telling us about the current state of the world? Uh, when push comes to shove, when the really difficult situation arises, is everyone on their own? I mean, the borders, the national borders seem to be a very powerful still, despite all the uh, globalization and uh, all the uh, humanity coming closer to each other by means of technology when something nasty and bad happens borders of national countries of nations seem to be shutting down are they going to stay shut and for how long are they going to stay shut for instance when are you going to start what's your projection for instance when are you going to start receiving visitors to the united states again the uh idea of the shutdown is the following by a temporary shutdown of 60 to 90 days the virus transmission stops to a very large extent because an individual most recover a small number tragically die but either way the virus stops transmitting if that shutdown has occurred 
So the theory of the shutdown, to the extent that there is a theory, because the textbooks have not been written, is that uh, after 60 to 90 days, the number of infections is so low that we can use more targeted means, what I call public health means rather than shutdown, to control the spread of the virus after that. What public health control is, is quick notification of any new symptomatic case, testing immediately, and then tracing all the contacts and prevent preventively isolating those people and testing them quickly. If the number of viral transmissions is very low, then it's possible to manage, not with a lockdown, but with this very targeted case management. And that is the idea that we follow 60 or 90 days of relative shutdown by a targeted public health approach. Now, there are uh, lots of uncertainties about this. First, during the shutdown phase, will we really break the transmission adequately? Will people abide by it and <clears throat> will the number of new cases go down? Second, will we use the period not only in an experience of tragedy and chaos, but to build a public health effort very quickly? Because most countries, including the United States, don't have the capacity to test, monitor, trace contacts the way that the East Asian countries do. So can we build the public health capacity urgently so we can come out of the shutdown? And then 60 or 90 days later, how will we handle transit? International, but also national. Uh, there should be someone with a thermometer uh, or temperature monitor uh, coming off of every airplane, going through customs and so on. We now all have that experience of having that pointed at our forehead and you get a, a very uh, quick reading, apparently relatively accurate. We're going to have to yeah, screen. But it's, it's, you, don't, you don't need to have a temperature in order to be uh, spreading infection. You can be totally asymptomatic and still be very it, contagious, it is, right? It, it's absolutely possible. So one of the things that I'm sure will be done is lifting the uh, barriers only when countries as a whole show that their level of transmission has been dramatically reduced. But the idea, the theory is that we're not closing down the economy for the long term, but for a short enough period of time to stop the transmission and then not to give up or to say, well, now it's over, but rather to scale up a far less costly, less intrusive means of control. Having said all of that, even 60 or 90 days of shutdown is dramatic for societies that are not equipped for it. People need to eat. They need to be provisioned. People need water and sanitation. Uh, and even the psychological hardship, as hard as that is, there is a physical need during this period of keeping the food production and the supply chains and the provisioning and if it's food markets and so forth open but in a way that doesn't continue to transmit the disease our local uh, supermarket uh, shut down because there were cases being transmitted uh, and so uh, just down the block from us uh, our favorite place to shop uh, has uh, closed down because it was transmitting uh, covid uh, and uh, they need to have uh, different kinds of precautionary measures. So we're in a lot of uncertainty about the effectiveness of the shutdown and its manageability and its social decency. In principle, 60 or 90 days of not going outside, uh, except for very limited means, we could survive that. Uh, but uh, we can't survive not eating. We can't survive not having medicines. We can't survive. Uh, we can survive not having much income as long as we have the food and the basic needs provided. But take a country like India, which is in lockdown right now. 1.3 billion people, hundreds of millions of impoverished people, no adequate public health system. Well, 
what we hear hour by hour now is there's a lot of chaos uh, and how people are going to survive, whether this shutdown works, whether the virus is going to continue to be transmitted, uh, how big the impact will be on that mass, very densely uh, populated uh, society is one of the huge questions uh, of, of the planet. India is not China in its capacity for organization, action, and response by any means. And the people are much poorer, uh, and uh, the health system is much weaker, uh, the public health system. So this is a completely uncharted uh, drama. Uh, so let me, let, me, let me move now for a to the to the developed world, to to the United States, sure. to the most uh, powerful, one of the richest nation, probably the most powerful uh, nation in the history of mankind under the current circumstances seem to be struggling in a really serious way. What's the reason for a situation being so bad in America uh, with all its wealth, with all its power? Uh, why is it? so dramatic over there in your own country? Well, uh, let's uh, say, first of all, that uh, <clears throat> the US and Europe are all struggling right now because we were not prepared either in Europe or in the United States. <clears throat> how long we struggle and how uh, bad the situation turns out to be depends uh, a lot on the quality of leadership and the effectiveness of these policies. Uh, we have Donald Trump as president. Uh, he is uh, unequipped for a crisis like this. Uh, he's a showman and a populist. He's not a serious manager, and he is uh, throughout his life uh, incapable of listening to others and listening to expertise. So in our case, uh, when the virus was first announced uh, on January 11. The federal government did almost nothing. Uh, when the first case was confirmed in the United States on January 20th, uh, the federal government did almost nothing. Uh, our Centers for Disease Control had been really uh, weakened by Trump in the last couple of years by budget cuts, by the anti-science attitude, by the dismantling of uh, key uh, units uh, within the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. So the response for six to eight weeks was horrendous. Uh, and Trump kept saying one stupid thing after another. Uh, this isn't serious. It's all under control. It's going to go away. He's a fool uh, and uh, he didn't listen or know how to listen or even have the idea of listening to experts. So we lost six or eight weeks. And in an epidemic where the number of cases is doubling every few days, if you lose six to eight weeks, you end up in the middle of disaster. And that's where we are right now. To this moment, I can't say whether uh, were any better in our federal management. Uh, everything is now relying on governors and mayors at a local level. We have shortages of all supplies. Trump, again, is he's a fool. Uh, and uh, we're experiencing the huge costs of having a fool, a kind of clown, uh, as president. Uh, now, we're so rich in this country that uh, Congress voted and it's real. They voted $2 trillion uh, of emergency relief. Who other in the world could even imagine numbers like this? Uh, some of it will do good. A, a lot of it will depend on whether we have any coherence uh, in our policy leadership. The cities and the states are still waiting for some money and, and some relief. But the United States, you know, it's uh, like you say, we have more cushion, more expertise, more everything, uh, and still a terribly weak response. And, you know, when I write about what uh, China is doing or East Asia is doing, I get a lot of hate mail uh, 
of course, we're not sure that the Chinese uh, data are accurate and so on. But uh, the U.S., because of its uh, arrogance, has a, a lot of uh, tendency not to look at other cases. So we don't look around the world and ask what is working, what isn't working. There's a kind of American blindness uh, because of the power uh, that uh, also is crippling right now. I write every day almost someplace, uh, look to East Asia, let's learn. And that generates as much hate as it does uh, anything else uh, in terms of the, yeah, the now, responses. What you mentioned is this humongous uh, stimulus package, $2 trillion. It's probably the largest package in financial package in history that is 2,000 billions of dollars that are committed by the U.S. government to, uh, to ameliorate the, uh, the results of this crisis. My question is, why is this money, uh, why this money wasn't available? before uh, because before uh once you started uh, you know talking about the need for government uh placing funds here and funds there they'd say no no it wouldn't be fiscally responsible we don't have that much money same thing applies uh, for germans that are uh you know uh notoriously uh, stingy in a way with their uh, black zeros and deficits being written into uh into constitution so uh america and germany all of a sudden of course two very rich nations but all of a sudden yes money is available we can throw money we can helicopter money onto people M my question was why wasn't this money available before uh, and it looks like uh bernie Sanders, despite his uh problematic present standing in the opinion polls and in the democratic primaries he seemed to be vindicated because it seems as if this you know uh, package was uh, written up by people who would be advising him as president and uh, not donald trump and not current leadership of both democrats and republicans you know, Vuk, uh, the U.S. Uh, economy produces in a normal year about uh, $21 trillion. So to be able to spend $2 trillion is 10% of the national income. And uh, the U.S. can do that if it chooses to do that. Our political system uh, has uh, been in the hands of uh, rich and powerful uh, individuals and companies who want low taxes and don't want the government to do much, uh, except when the bailouts are needed. So we have a uh, so-called uh, neoliberal uh, political system. I don't think that's the wish of the American people by and large, uh, but it means that when an issue like climate change arises or fighting poverty or other things, we are told there's no money. Uh, in this uh, crisis, of course, there was money because in a $21 trillion economy, you could find $2 trillion uh, of an emergency appropriation. But your question really is about choices that societies make over the long term. Uh, Trump repeatedly was proposing budget cuts for public health every year of his administration. He was dismantling units at tiny cost that would have helped keep us safer from this virus. He closed down a team of public health specialists that was stationed in China as an advanced epidemic warning system. And so this is, this is so sad uh, because this is what populism is. Uh, you know, you say, we're not gonna waste money on these pointy headed experts. And then suddenly your country is in the midst of more than 100,000 viral infections and spreading very rapidly, and the whole economy is shut down. So these people are utter fools. I've been saying that Trump is a fool since the first day he came to office. You're not supposed to say that about a president, I'm told sometimes. But when the president is a fool, you need to say it. I can tell because you we... that. What's that? I can tell you stories about criticizing presidents. Yeah, no, you know, 
what we need in our world is truth speaking because we have to take care of ourselves. We have to speak the truth about things like climate change, how dangerous that is. We have to speak the truth about this epidemic. We have to understand and learn and the propaganda has to end so that we can actually survive. This is one of the most essential messages. We need teams right now of top experts talking with each other across the planet. I want to know, I urgently want to know, is the Chinese data or are the Chinese data accurate? If they are, my God, this is very important for the whole world to understand, to take the implications. We need the discussion of the experts now. The politicians can't carry that discussion. What do they do when they talk to each other? They don't know what we need. We need the expertise speaking with each other. Uh, this, of course, is partly the responsibility of the World Health Organization. It's partly the responsibility of the United Nations. It's why we have these multilateral institutions. Uh, most of the time, as you know better than anybody, they're beaten up by the big powers. Uh, oh, why do we need the UN? We need the UN because we live in an interconnected world. So we needed to be able to function. So let me ask you, let, let, let's now move on to international repercussions of this. The last thing that I'm gonna say about the US stimulus package is that uh, a lot of people noticed that out of $2 trillion, very, very little money was apportioned for anything to be spent outside the United States. So uh, all this money, of course, in the center of attention of American government is the American people. But America is the most powerful country in the world. And it seems like America is, at least at this stage, totally disinterested from engaging with the rest of the world in, uh, in fighting this global pandemic. There is very little American leadership right now, at least this is how it looks from the outside. This stimulus package is not alleviating any of these fears. So if America is not leading right now, who is leading? Is anybody leading? And uh, we, you talk about people talking to each other, okay, at the expert level, but is anybody talking to anybody at this moment, really? at the top of the world. Uh, because I remember in 2008, when, uh, when we had a great financial crisis, there were uh, some swift moves at the G20 level by the world governments, the governments of the most, uh, of the most powerful and rich countries to, to decisively deal with the effects of the great financial crisis. None of it seems to be happening right now. What do you think? You know, uh... America has been the most powerful and richest country, but it has not been a leader for a very long time. Uh, the United States does not lead the world. It bullies the world. And this has been true for now uh, probably 20 years, uh, <clears throat> but it got a lot worse under Trump because he is uh, unfit for diplomacy and for cooperation. Uh, I think he's mentally disordered uh, so that he lacks uh, any kind of uh, empathy or sympathy or uh, feelings for others anyway. Uh, that's a clinical uh, hypothesis of uh, many psychologists, but on an observational level, his uh, talk about America first is a vulgar ugliness. Uh, it is a denial of common humanity. It is a denial of mutual accountability and responsibility. Trump is the one that pulled the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement. That by itself is an act of uh, insanity. Uh, then uh, Trump imposes harsh sanctions on other countries. He bullies other countries, whether they're allies or not. He engages in his so-called trade wars and so on. 
Uh, he objects to the United Nations. We don't have U.S. leadership. What I have found very sad is that uh, as the U.S. leadership disappeared, there hasn't been uh, really uh, uh, any uh, filling of the vacuum uh, because the rest of the world should have said at least we will continue to cooperate strongly with each other. Uh, and uh, if the United States uh, doesn't want to cooperate, uh, we'll continue. You know how weak that is uh, actually uh, with, with the US not only not leading, but not even cooperating. Uh, global cooperation is uh, completely at a uh, weak, frayed period. Now, uh, will Europe be able to deal with this as European Union? Doesn't look like it. Uh, Europe has shut its borders, unimaginable in a union, but it happened uh, almost overnight. Uh, there's just a nationalist outbreak uh, in Europe uh, to deal with this, very, which is really very sad. Can China do more? It should. If it's correct what we're hearing, that China is coming out of this phase of the epidemic, China should provide more uh, help to the rest of the world than it has done so far. Uh, the virus started in China. It uh, has spread from China. China, it seems, has uh, developed uh, ways to control it. It's important for China to step forward now with supplies. Uh, with equipment, with the uh, cooperation and public health guidance, and this could make a significant difference. Of course, uh, I and you uh, are champions of the multilateral institutions. I want to see the UN functioning at the highest possible performance right now. I want WHO to have the resources and the uh, energy and the capacity to create in every way those uh, discussions that are essential by the minute and by the hour right now so that we have the best information. We're not going to get it from Trump, that's for sure. We have to get it from those who are capable of managing such a high-level, intensive, expert, uh, informed uh, global discussion and global cooperation. So let me ask you uh, about uh, your field um, of study and in, 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 in your life, which is global economy. Uh, what do you think is going to be a uh, repercussion of this on the global economy? Some people are talking about uh, not just entering a, a greater recession, a recession greater than uh, the big recession of 2008. But so people are even talking about depression, depression of the size and the longevity of the ones in the 20s and 30s. What do you think? What is going to be the impact on the world economy? And when do you think that the world economy is going to start bouncing back? You know, the uh, measured downturn, uh, as we conventionally measure it, of the gross domestic product will be the sharpest decline recorded in modern history. Uh, we will have output declines of 10, 20, or 30 percent uh, in the second quarter of this year. Uh, because of the lack of synchronization, this process of decline and uh, breaking up of trade and uh, difficulties of supply chains is likely to persist one way or another for the next year or two. Uh, of course, countries should be able to come out of the extreme lockdown within 60 or 90 days, but we won't return to normalcy in this world for one or two years minimum. And then definitely at the end of this, we'll have a new normal or a chronic abnormal. We will not simply bounce back. It will be gone and things will come back to normal. The disruptions that are 
uh, being created right now are serious and will be persistent. The damage in poorer countries will be hard to recover in the short term. Life just bouncing back to how it was beforehand <clears throat> is not going to happen. Uh, we'll have a restructuring of the economy. Some things will actually be positive. We'll learn how to do uh, more things online, more things virtually, uh, with uh, less uh, wear and tear on the planet of uh, all of the business travel, because that will definitely diminish uh, in the long term. We'll have more e-commerce. We'll have uh, more uh, ways to use the digital infrastructure than we did uh, before this mm -hmm. crisis. There will be places, pockets of transmission for an unforeseeable future, definitely months, possibly a year or two, meaning that uh, completely open uh, travel, trade, carefree, as if we're in a pre-COVID world, isn't coming back suddenly. When crises occur, uh, it is politics that determines their course. The story of the 19. 20s and 1930s is that the legacy of World War I left so many distortions uh, that it gave rise to horrific politics that in the 1930s produced Nazism uh, and uh, fascism uh, more generally and led onward to the Great Depression, lack of uh, problem solving, and then World War II. So crises can lead to even deeper crises. A crises can also lead to solutions. After World War II, uh, the world uh, got its head together and said, not again. Uh, and uh, the difference uh, in part was there were some great leaders uh, in World War II, like Franklin Roosevelt, who said, we need a United Nations at the end uh, to keep the peace uh, afterwards. So a lot of this, of course, depends on what we make of it. The worst of the crisis in each country will be a few months because that's the nature of an epidemic. It's like a tsunami. Uh, it smashes uh, your society, it smashes uh, uh, the economy, but then there's an aftermath. Uh, that's the first point. We have to prepare today for the rebuilding afterwards. Second is the lack of synchronization globally. Uh, this will have hugely differential impacts and timing. How are we going to cooperate as opposed to falling deeper into disarray? We need leaders who understand it's not their country first. It is the world interconnected. That's why Trump is such a profound danger even before this, but is so profoundly inappropriate now and in the future because every idea that he has promoted has been dangerous now we see clearly also for the american people themselves but certainly for the world and we need leadership well, that is globally cooperative my last question before i dive into some of the questions that were sent by uh, uh people from serbia and the rest of the balkans especially for you i i want to ask some of them, but my last question to you is going to be, what are going to be the implications of this crisis for democracy? And are we in a danger of uh, entering a big brother society? You know, all these apps that may or may not prove to be vital in getting us out of the crisis. It's certainly in China, it helped a great deal. But now we're saying not just in China or in Russia, but also in a place like Israel, that uh, technology, the government is deciding to use technology to, uh, to counter the effects of this, to contain uh, the contagion. But is it going to stay after this is over? Are we going to be looked over in a much more uh, privacy-free way than before? And are the wave of uh, populism and, and the nationalism that is swamping, especially the old continent in the United States, these, uh, is this going to stay with us? Is democracy going to be able to recover uh, after 
after this, or is it going to be another victim of this major disruption? What do you think? Well, as usual, Boop, you're asking really tough questions <laughs> and, uh, you know, ones that uh, I don't have any ready answer for. I think uh, a lot will depend on uh, how we actually do uh, in, uh, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, if, if, the dem if the democracies uh, are able to get this under control, uh, I think that that uh, can mean that our basic democratic institutions uh, are uh, not fatally weakened. On the other hand, uh, if it proves to be the case that it's authoritarian societies that get this under control and the democracies prove ineffectual, that's uh, going to be bad news for uh, how our institutions work and how they are regarded. Uh, I think personally that what China has done in stopping this epidemic, if it's right and real, uh, shows a way to manage that can be operated in a democracy as well for 60 to 90 days without giving up the democratic institutions. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, if uh, the democracies prove unable to act because it's, it we're incoherent and, uh, uh, and unable to agree on measures and so on, uh, then uh, the, the consequences for our political institutions will be much greater. Remember that in the 1930s, it was said democracy is dead. Uh, it's only the fascist the regime that shows how to make the economy recover and so on. Uh, this proved to be uh, a disastrously wrong yeah. idea. It was democracies that flourished after World War II uh, and uh, proved wrong those who had proclaimed the death of democracy. And I certainly hope that our democracies are able to function now. Democracies can operate uh, in a uh, in an emergency environment and stay democratic. Uh, you know, uh, the United States was an example uh, in the Great Depression and World War II. We had Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and he was uh, both a Democrat as a big D Democrat in the political party, but as a small D Democrat and really uh, being uh, a politician uh, of the people and elected by the people. It's interesting to recall that uh, Britain's greatest uh, wartime leader, Winston Churchill, at the very end of World War II was defeated uh, in uh, the election after he had helped win the war, he was defeated in the first election by Clement Attlee uh, in the summer of 1945. So the democracy survived the, even the Great Depression and World War II. So I don't want to give up on democracies. Uh, I don't want to give up on global cooperation. I don't want to give up on the global economy. I want us to take our best measures now. I am a believer that expertise, whether it's epidemiologists, virologists, uh, engineers, uh, energy system specialists are really important for us. The demagoguery against expertise is one of the biggest dangers of the populist age. Uh, this is uh, one of the most pernicious aspects of Trump's uh, foolishness. Uh, and it's uh, maybe something that we can learn from this, uh, that if you disdain the expertise, you leave yourself open to terrible, terrible results. Well, thank you. Thank you for this. This is, this is, this is why, this is why uh, I love you so much. And this is why uh, it was your influence on me at the MPID that uh, made a decisive difference to the rest of my life. I fully subscribe to your point of view, Jeff. Uh, but I'd love to ask you a few questions that were sure. mailed in or put on by people, by some uh, uh, students and, 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 and others from Serbia and, uh, and the rest of the region. I'm going to start by a question from Eva. Uh, she asks, uh, which creative fiscal mechanism should a small lockdown economy like Serbia 
think about for curbing this massive shock. Eva, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question. I think the uh, most urgent tasks are prepare the public health system, prepare the hospitals as much as possible, and give social support for the lockdown period for elderly people, for people who need food delivered, for people who need social support, for people who won't eat otherwise because they are unemployed. So think about specific measures with a time horizon of 90 to 120 days that Serbia needs to take right now. The longer term future will take care of itself somehow, uh, or have to wait, let's put it that way. Uh, but the short term, think of uh, all the things that need to be done in the next 120 days. Don't scrimp on those because uh, the society depends on them. Make sure that people can survive the lockdown. Make sure that the health workers are protected. Make sure that the hospitals can function. And uh, then let's talk again in 90 or 120 days about uh, the best ways to uh, restart the economy and pick up the pieces. But now focus on the short term urgencies and make good priorities. Spend the money, borrow the money. Uh, if there is urgent need, I'm pressing uh, the IMF and others to lend freely and openly. The IMF has created an emergency fiscal facility to just give governments money to have the means right now. Worry about the longer term consequences later, but right now take actions to fight the epidemic. Thank you. Uh, this is now uh, from Milan from Kraljevo. He's asking uh, you, uh, what is this crisis telling us about private versus state-based healthcare systems? And which ones do you think are going to better perform in this crisis? State-based, state-based, state-based. Uh, private health is uh, paying money to fight diseases. Public health is keeping the population healthy with prevention, with surveillance, and with universal access of all people, whether they're poor or rich, to the health care that they need. So we should not have privatized health systems. Exactly how to organize the health system is a, is a long discussion. By public health system, I mean a system where it is the public budget that pays for the health system and that uh, enables everybody to participate and that gives a good uh, investment both in prevention and surveillance as well as disease treatment itself. And uh, the private health system cannot do this. Well, thank you. Uh, now this is from uh, Hannah from Belgrade how this will affect our everyday life in the next five years. Anna, if this uh, works properly, uh, your life will be uh, inside mostly for the next uh, 60 to 90 days. Cautious uh, for uh, the uh, six months after that. Uh, and then uh, I would say able to uh, have a, a, a mostly normal, but still cautious uh, life after that. In other words, think of it in phases. Uh, the first phase is to get through the epidemic itself. The second phase is cautiously to return to a new normal. Uh, and the, the third is uh, to take the lessons of this experience in how we act and how we behave. I hope uh, we're all uh, more attentive to public health, to hygiene and so forth after this. Uh, but uh, the idea of a return to our uh, conditions of uh, life uh, before the epidemic is truly possible if we take decisive measures in the next few months.
Nadia from Zrenyanin is asking you, uh, what is this happening about the price of oil and what is going to be future of energy as a result of this crisis? In other words, is this going to have a positive or negative effect on uh, renewables and alternative forms of energy? Of course, what's happened is that uh, airplane travel has uh, been shut down. Uh, most uh, personal uh, automobile travel has been shut down. Uh, and the result is that the daily use of uh, petroleum has uh, fallen sharply. And that would normally put downward pressure on the prices. Then uh, there was some geopolitics mixed into this story because uh, Saudi Arabia asked the Russian government to join in cutting back supply so that the price wouldn't fall so much. And uh, the Russians apparently said, no, thank you. And so the Saudis said, well, if you won't cut, we won't cut. We'll even expand our production in the midst of this glut. And so oil prices collapsed. They were already relatively low, but they've declined from about $60 a barrel to uh, under $30 a barrel. But nobody's buying because we're locked down. Now, uh, what should happen is we should take the lesson and shift to uh, less uh, use of fossil fuels for the long term because it wasn't healthy to be using so much oil, coal, and gas to begin with. It was wrecking the planet and creating massive air pollution. Uh, one uh, side effect of this lockdown is the air is much cleaner now over the last 30 days uh, than it has been in years and years. We should uh, take some wisdom and say, we're not going back to buying all that oil in the future because we knew even before this crisis, we should not be addicted to oil. We should be making the shift to uh, renewable energy for our own safety. Like everything else, uh, nobody was listening in the political class uh, in the United States, uh, in Russia, in other places. They just wanted to, in Saudi Arabia, they wanted to sell oil. As usual, uh, no responsibility towards the future. But we need to learn from this. Uh, and one of the learnings can be we're, we've got to get by without reverting to the petroleum addiction again. That's fascinating. And this is surely an enormous opportunity that is coming out of this uh, very unfortunate situation. Surgeon from Belgrade uh, is asking you, will this unprecedented crisis give rise to new world political movements or perhaps even parties that may be of international nature? That's a good uh, supposition and a good question. Politics will change. Uh, who knows how exactly it should change. Uh, I'm personally uh, committed, uh, and so is VUC, to a politics of sustainable development. The idea that uh, even before this crisis, we should be organized to balance economic, social, and environmental considerations. And uh, we needed a new politics anyway uh, in order to bring that about. Uh, in Europe, in the parliamentary elections last spring, which seemed like ages ago, the Green parties did better uh, and uh, pushed Europe towards a so-called European Green Deal. It's been pushed out of the headlines for the moment because of the epidemic, but it was a new kind of politics taking shape. And I think uh, this epidemic should, in the best response, lead to a new kind of forward-looking politics that says we're capable and rich, but we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to diseases, we're vulnerable to climate change, we're vulnerable to environmental destruction, we're vulnerable to populists who in their uh, demagogy 
and their ignorance try to lead us away from knowledge and just to uh, vulgar uh, emotions of hate and distrust, Trump's kind of politics. And if we uh, learn from this horrible experience, uh, maybe we can learn exactly in the direction that you're suggesting. Now, new kinds of political movements also are possible that are very dangerous. One can imagine uh, using a crisis like this for even more demagoguery, uh, even more lies, uh, closing uh, down to each other, uh, more nationalism and so on. That would be a huge risk, but it's a real possibility. Thank you very, Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff. This was really fascinating, and uh, I will close this conversation uh, with uh, with one last question. If uh, if you were to advise the Secretary General of the United Nations, as uh, and, and and I know that you advise the whole series of Secretary Generals, I wish I wish you were in a position to advise me as well but if you were to advise UN Secretary General today what are the three things that the United Nations Secretary General should do in the next let's say week what would those three things be well uh, I'll give you the suggestions that I am making first that uh, we need a global finance that is like the US uh, legislation, but for countries that can't afford the $2 trillion uh, U.S. package. So I'm urging that the IMF, which started with an emergency facility of $60 billion, double that, triple that, quadruple that, so that every country can get urgent support that they need. Second, I, I am uh, urging uh, that uh, our international organizations, led by the World Health Organization, provide intensively the information and the knowledge to enable governors and mayors and uh, leaders of nations to take sound, urgent policies right now uh, in order to uh, uh, know what to do and to act uh, in a scientifically and ethically sound way. So uh, all of our international organizations have a role to play in that, but I would put the World Health Organization uh, in the forefront. Third, I would uh, urge uh, that all nations that have the wherewithal, that's many, step up and provide every kind of global assistance. China has a huge responsibility here and a huge capability. Uh, if the data are right, they're producing again. Their industries are open. Let them produce ventilators and face masks and other urgent uh, personal protective uh, equipment and uh, machinery that we need. Uh, let them help uh, on uh, guiding uh, how to fight this epidemic successfully uh, and so forth. But the U.S. obviously, by definition, as we talked about, could do vastly more to support the world <clears throat> effort. Europe could do more. And uh, Secretary General can, should, and is calling on all nations not only to look inward, but to understand that if we are going to get through this quickly, if we are going to restore our economies, if we are going to return to the kind of lives we want as soon as possible, we have to have this under control everywhere. And that means global cooperation and global solidarity. Thank you very much, Jeff. This is a wonderful note to end uh, this conversation on. I must admit that this was the most sane hour that I have personally had in the past week. Thank you for that. I'm sure that uh, a lot of our viewers. Great talking with you. Uh, it's it's a relief. It's a it's a relief for me to speak with you because we can speak on a nice, level-headed way in the midst of uh, so much confusion. So I really appreciate it.
Thank you very much for uh, clarifying so many things uh, to me and to our audience. Uh, I wish you the and best of we'll luck and regards to everybody. I know that you're in touch with uh, world leaders, with many people around the world. I look forward to tuning in tomorrow on the conference call of the UNSDSN. So uh, I'll see you tomorrow and in we'll, the conference call. If, if I may. Send my warmest regards to everybody. If I may uh, also, just to say to everybody listening, be careful, stay safe, uh, really be careful because uh, it's, a, it's a terrible virus and uh, you can stay out of harm's way. So find ways to uh, shelter, uh, to be protected, uh, to uh, help a family and friends, but without uh, getting in harm's way for anybody. And we'll get through this together. Thank you very much, Jeff. All the best Thanks. to you Thanks. and Bye. have a great weekend. Bye. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.